Welcome, Mario. We are excited to hear you present sustainability and resilience through local production with open source. Mario Belling is the CEO of OpenTech, and I'm going to let him provide a brief introduction and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you very much, Kathy. I appreciate it. And yeah, this is really um, cool, like that we can use entirely um, free and open systems here to connect with each other in those challenging times. And um, yeah, my topic is also related to these challenging times, sustainability and resilience through local production with open source. So this talk is not so much about the technical aspects and uh, the process. This session is um, more about the larger ecosystem and why we need sustainable and resilient uh, production and then why this is only possible with open source in my view. I will um, share more details with you in a moment, but before I would like to say, if you have any quick question, I am open um, uh, for um, uh, quick questions also during the talks. If they don't uh, take too much time, we can also discuss a little bit um, after the session. So please feel free to um, like, you know, share something quickly. I'm monitoring the chat here um, if you have anything quickly. And of course, also we have the shared notes as um, Casey pointed out, um, if you want to go more into detail. So um, yeah, let me switch off the cam so we can focus on the slides. Um, so a little bit about my background first. So I'm the founder of Open Tech. Um, it's a company in Germany. We do exclusively um, free and open source software and hardware. In um, 2020, now we joined the Open Next program where we develop open hardware with 19 partners across Europe. It's a project that's funded by the European Union. I've been in Asia for many years. Um, I lived in uh, Singapore. I lived uh, several years in uh, Vietnam. I've also been uh, for um, yeah uh, longer times in Taiwan and China. Um, also, like worked on the One Laptop Per Child project uh, in Afghanistan and spent an entire year um, there, uh, like working, for example, on the in the University of uh, Kabul. And I love learning languages. And whoever sees me, they never believe I used to have long hair and played in a rock band. We were on TV and yeah, uh, famous, well, medium famous, I would say here uh, locally. And uh, I believe in uh, open tech as a solution for many of our uh, global problems. The picture that you see here, by the way, um, that is the first car um, uh, in, in the museum of uh, bands, Daimler and bands in Stuttgart. And so I'm always excited to, to see these um, yeah, icons of uh, industrial change and change is also taking place today. So let me start with an opening statement here. Um, sustainable and resilient production and business operations are important, especially in times of crisis when it is necessary to plan ahead for unforeseen circumstances. We need to increasingly consider sustainability and resilience as part of many aspects of society. This means business, the global economy, health systems, food supplies, and of course the environment and many more. So how does open source enable resilient and sustainable local production then. So here um, a few points um, that many of us who have an open source software background know because many advantages we know from free and open source software also valid for open source production, open hardware and so on. What can you do? You can develop and provide your own solutions, software, hardware, knowledge, and services because you use open licenses. You can add new features to the hardware, to your production system. You can solve bugs quickly um, and um, adapt uh, your pipelines just like in software. You can attract contributors. You can work online from around the world on open development platforms and you can support each other here as well. Of course, it's all digital, so you can transfer digital files 
to um, real production um, or to real hardware. And that means you can scale up around the world. You can deploy these solutions um, and create prototypes locally and decentralized. So you don't depend on central uh, production platforms. And therefore you can be more cost efficient because you can provide this solution to more people. For example, sending the file digitally around the world at no cost, or you can um, sell this, um, uh, these products together with partners. Of course, like right to repair is a big point here. And it uh, could be very beneficial um, to repair, um, for example, old hardware, especially electronics. Um, and of course, that's an awesome customer experience. And if you see uh, that uh, something works again. So a few more details what this means. Open development and production means collaborating. So because you use free and open licenses, you don't have to send um, like a contract to somebody if you want to uh, work together with them, uh, because you can just say here um, is our code, here are our schematics, here um, is uh, the information how to produce something. It is uh, um, freely licensed and uh, you can access it under these conditions that you share it again and uh, under the uh, freedoms that um, uh, are stated in the licenses. And of course, we need more open standards here. We need to work with open standards. So if you work with uh, like free and open hardware, if you work in production uh, pipelines and so on, you need uh, open standards. This is something that we need to work on. And you can take advantage of many things. For example, access to issue trackers. You don't need to keep your development secret. You can openly communicate with people, invite them um, to, to look at what you're doing and invite them to collaborate with you. Meaning you can build developer communities. And these communities um, can use all the open tools that already exist. So we're expanding to hardware, we're expanding to production, but we already have free and open source software. We have these open standards. And one of the oldest ones, of course, email. Yes, a great tool. So, and what's the next step then? Um, you uh, work on the hardware, work on the production and you need uh, uh, documentation. So you also share the documentation. You can invite um, contributors that, uh, for example, are not developers that have different backgrounds. This is all uh, open to everyone. Um, I've given a talk um, earlier this year at FOSTEM. Then if you're interested in the technical aspects, I invite you to look at this talk where I uh, talk about how we can um, take advantage on um, uh, uh, like, automating open hardware production uh, using continuous integration. And this is really something cool because um, possibly you could like uh, automatically produce open hardware just like you um, produce open source software, prototyping it and so on. Please uh, check out my talk um, uh, at FOSTEM about this. And then you can develop a decentralized system. We know these peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, sharing platforms and solutions. You can do the same thing now with hardware. You can do local production, send your digital file anywhere and produce it locally. So working with business models based on open source solution is possible now. And uh, um, yeah, we are starting to see that more and more. Open collaboration is therefore a key to resilient and sustainable um, uh, local production. Um, but we want to know a little bit more in detail here about this. Why is it more resilient and sustainable? Um, we want to know um, what's really here. Um, what is this really all about? So um, let me uh, dive in a bit uh, into the state of the world. Um, as we uh, currently see it. So it just seems there are crises everywhere. We have the pandemic crisis at the moment. Then we have political crisis in many parts of the world and we have the climate crisis. So what is this about? So the pandemic crisis um, and uh, in regards to open source, let's talk about this First, I have the picture here. Sorry, we are closed. Um, yes, businesses are closed everywhere in the world. 
borders are shut. Um, uh, we even saw that here in Europe, where suddenly you couldn't go uh, um, to other countries. And um, I'm currently uh, in Berlin, and this was really horrible because Germany is the country uh, with most borders, um, with, with like facing most borders uh, or facing many borders with uh, other countries in, in, in Europe and just 80 kilometers away from Berlin, for example, we have Poland and suddenly the border was closed. And it's a really horrible um, uh, time when, when suddenly like beloved ones couldn't get uh, to one another anymore. So, but that also mean, meant uh, distribution channels um, uh, um, are closed or were closed. Um, it's, it's, it's the case in many parts of the world suddenly like you, you can't get your goods uh, freely around anymore. And also another thing that happened was demand for products such as masks or even toilet paper suddenly rise. Uh, when the Corona crisis started, I was in Singapore and it was uh, somehow bizarre to see um, how uh, um, there were long um, queues in a fair price uh, supermarkets um, uh, when people like really stocking up on, on, on toilet paper and so on. Um, yeah, that uh, was a rising demand and uh, um, well, people felt they needed, but the market couldn't keep up with it. Suddenly there were not enough masks, suddenly no toilet paper, some basic goods uh, were missing. So um, where well, we always heard for many years, the market can solve any problem um, in times of crisis, especially it cannot. Prices surge, products become unavailable, scams happen. Um, you can see online many videos, many people uh, uh, talking about how suddenly like Chinese students bought up uh, like huge supplies of masks everywhere in the world, sent them back to China and uh, later on uh, sold them then back again to these countries at a huge profit. So these scams happen. This is really um, a, a horrible um, thing that happened here in the market society. Um, another example is our dependence on mobile phone monopolies. Um, Apple and Google, for example, um, they uh, supporting now um, like with features of contact tracing, but we are really depending on two big companies that are based in um, one part of the world and the entire uh, global population depends on like a, a feature here. Well, I don't think this is a good solution where people all over the world only depend on two companies. So, um, um, yeah, and I have more examples, specialized equipment su such as ventilators, like we were um, at the FOSS Asia Summit in, in Singapore and it really broke my heart uh, when I heard how um, uh, companies try to stop um, like local makers from uh, making spare parts um, for ventilators and that were really needed, for example, in Italy um, for people who were uh, dying. So, and this was all only in the uh, name of profit. And that was really heartbreaking to me. Maybe some of you who were there uh, remember that. So self-supporting, helping oneself um, is uh, threatened with IP laws. It is threatened with corporate, with patents, um, all of these things. And uh, the risk for um, uh, like really communities or for personal groups or even like um, small companies locally, is it's, it's, it's very big. Um, so traditional proprietary IP control distribution models business development practice and hiring processes, all of these, they don't work in a pandemic. If you suddenly need somebody to develop something for you or, or to, 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 to help in a hospital and develop a solution, you cannot go through this entire process um, uh, of hiring somebody, of, of, of making a tender and all these things. Um, you need a more hands-on approach. You need, you need local participation. So, so I think many of us see this. And um, I have here in gray, like um, my um, approach is that I think local production can really um, help to solve that. And it must be decentralized production. We can't depend uh, on, on like a producer in one part of the world. It must be able, uh, it must be possible for companies to um, produce um, uh, locally to, to solve their problem and especially technologies that are, um, or that should be widely available and we can't wait to lift these IP restrictions. So 
all of this means it must be open source, therefore, otherwise I don't see in other ways. And in this way, we can also uh, collaborate um, around the globe. Um, we can work on digital copies of production files that can be easily shared um, anywhere. And like, even if the internet is down, we can still use USB sticks. Um, there are so many possibilities. So um, let me go to the next point here. Again, then we have the political crisis. So this picture on the right hand side um, is actually from Honduras in 2009. But uh, uh, there's a Marriott hotel on the left. Um, there are um, on the right hand side uh, um, ads on the building and so on. And um, if we look at this picture, um, we, and we wouldn't know it's from Honduras, then we might think it, it's from the US or from other parts of the world. Um, there are crises uh, on in, going on in many parts of the world. And this is really um, a, a global uh, yeah, thing now, right? Like, so this is also impacting um, us. And um, look further, look further uh, internationally. Also, there are confrontations and uh, to them also, for example, I, I just want to give um, the keynotes here. Many people follow it, the trade war um, with US and Australia, for example, on one side and also other uh, uh, countries versus China, where China, for example, um, threatened uh, Australia to ban the beef and uh, the US then is um, together on one side and um, they are threatening TikTok and, and yeah, you know about all these topics and uh, a lot of things are mingled, privacy issues and so on, but the result is it's, it's really a confrontation and we don't know where this will lead to. And then if you look to Europe, we have uh, Britain and the Brexit. Nobody thought it was um, ever possible. Uh, I myself spent um, a year um, in, in Britain um, because, um, yeah, I'm from East Germany and I felt my, my English wasn't so good. So I, I had the chance, my parents supported me to go to Britain and I was like so amazed how, how we um, have this united and, and, and opening up Europe. And now Britain is leaving and uh, they are even saying there will not be a trade agreement with the uh, European Union. So that will mean supply chains will be interrupted and there will be many problems. Then we have other um, topics here, like, for example, the NAFTA uh, agreement um, you, uh, where the US, for example, raised tariffs against products from Canada and Mexico. And I think like Canada did that as well. And yeah, it's like so a lot of confrontations are happening. And uh, um, we see like kind of like um, if you're not a global uh, kind of top tier company, and um, then um, um, you could uh, suffer a lot and you could um, potentially don't have access. So what I think here, again, production um, uh, doesn't have to depend on like one uh, company or on one country, we can do many things locally. And uh, um, again, in order to do this, of course, it must be open source licensed. And otherwise, how can we um, uh, make all these contracts? How can, can we really freely and efficiently uh, collaborate? So also here in this aspect, it could be, and it is in my view, a solution. And then let me go on. Climate crisis. The climate crisis, um, I did uh, some research online and I saw there already articles 10, 20 years ago um, about open source um, like being a solution um, for the climate uh, crisis and the climate change. Yeah, this topic is actually uh, very old already and it's sad that uh, not much has been done against uh, climate change. So what we are seeing is increased weather irregularities and we see a lot of disasters in Australia. And, and then one time we saw inundations, then like uh, uh, just a short time later, um, there were these huge fires everywhere in Australia. So this is really horrible. And um, then now, right now we're seeing wildfires in um, California. We see storms in other parts of the US. So it's really also affecting a lot of people. Then in Europe this year, we had some um, a bit more rain, for example, in Central Europe, but because the temperature is often much higher and the rain is uh, um, 
yeah, the, the, it's getting humid and um, the rain doesn't really go deep into the uh, ground and the ground is actually still relatively dry in parts of Spain, it's very dry. Right now, we also see um, uh, floods in China, we see droughts in Africa. So it seems to be true and there are articles and, and um, research papers out there that say um, signs are appearing that climate change is progressing faster and more radically than anyone could expect. So I wouldn't say I have the entire solution to this, but part of the solution again, we could provide the widest possible access to new environmentally friendly technologies. We could uh, make a green tech development a task for the entire society instead of just um, having uh, dedicated startups or some companies working on it. And this means everyone must have access to this uh, green tech development and it must be open source licensed so we can ensure a wide adoption everywhere in the world where we can uh, solve this problem. And uh, um, let me also uh, mention another angle here. We could reduce carbon footprint uh, by reducing the shipping of products. Why do we need these huge tankers going around the world um, when many products can actually be easily produced uh, locally? This is just a, a waste of, of energies and resources. So concluding this part, my opinion is in times of crisis, proprietary models fail society's need on many levels. The open approach alone will not be able to solve these problems, but it provides people from around the world a proven and tested collaboration framework and therefore a resilient and sustainable model to work on solutions. Because we are not talking about some dream here, like um, maybe like 20 years ago, people would have said, yeah, open source doesn't work and this is not possible. We have many companies, we have uh, um, like economies um, using uh, open source solutions on a big scale. It is mainstream already in many areas um, and there are many different models um, to, to make it, for example, work business-wise, to make it work on different levels. So this is not a dream. This is a proven model that we can now take and adopt um, elsewhere. So open source collaboration creates sustainable and resilient uh, solutions. We need to make it mainstream in order to uh, resolve those crises and resolve the problems in the world. And we need to create a more resilient and sustainable global society that takes advantage of the open source collaboration model. And so this is very important for me. Um, I uh, think it's not only about um, like open source license and now I release something on open source. The real benefit of open source is that, that we can all collaborate and um, we really um, must add this in, into our code of conducts that um, we should collaborate with um, companies that um, develop things in a collaborative way, just like uh, taking the advantages of the licenses and of the distribution model is not enough. Uh, open source is about collaboration and we need to enforce and, and encourage that collaboration. So how do we do this now practically? How do we create a resilient and sustainable open source um, model or even an open source society? What do we need to make this happen? So I don't have all the answers, but uh, I'm sure like there are a lot of people who think about this in the community. And um, here are a few ideas that I have. So um, in order to really inspire others, we need more open source success stories of companies and organizations. And I clearly mean here uh, companies and organizations that collaborate, that have the code open, that have the entire collaboration process open. We need funding for open source startups and a different uh, VC mentality. VC mentality um, often is like, a, um, in the way of, that was how I learned it and experienced it at different events and, and, and gathering that the VCs comes I, and was looking for the next uh, billion dollar startup um, that uh, basically dominates the market. But actually there can be many uh, startups and, and companies and organizations that continuously generate an income and that um, are so like good as like uh, um, developers and, and also um, 
uh, work in a business sense, they don't always have to be uh, the billion dollar startup or the uh, monopoly, duopoly or whatever poly. So they shouldn't be so uh, just like a few dominating um, uh, companies. So, and then another thing that we can do is legislation. Legislation, like the right to repair needs to be enforced. We need to make links here with the Climate uh, and Fridays for Future community. It is not acceptable that we cannot uh, um, like repair or update products, for example, from Apple, or that we cannot like uh, um, have access to um, all the features and possibly even like uh, environmentally uh, friendly features to uh, cars like uh, from, from Tesla, for example. And I think like we should really make this point and try uh, to contact uh, the people, Elon Musk or whatever, at Tesla. Um, this is uh, very important. And uh, um, I think they, they have many different ways to generate an income and uh, they don't need to harm the environment. Uh, um, by, by, by doing that, that, that can't be, that's just not acceptable. And uh, in, in order to uh, enforce all these things, and, and part of all these things is, of course, um, open standards. I don't want to go too much into detail here with the open standards um, because uh, it could be like an, an entire um, uh, session just dedicated or even track dedicated to open standards. And um, so we need to come up with ways to encourage and enforce the open source collaboration model instead of models that simply take advantage. And I'm, I have to call out here, unfortunately, Google. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they supported us uh, uh, here with Force Asia and, and Open Tech in the, in the past, but like um, still, right? I mean, like we have to address um, uh, points like, for example, the distribution model um, of, uh, of Android, which is not developed in the open as an open source project. It is just licensed and it, it doesn't really connect with others. So, so we need to brand this as a misconduct in our in our COCs and our code of conducts, the code of conducts are a little bit too much on how I, for me personally, on how I speak and so on. I'm not an English native speaker, um, even though it might sound right for some of you, but I, I have my challenges. It can't be the focus of code of conducts that uh, um, we address personal ways, how people address each other in all this way. This is all important and definitely I'm willing to learn, but um, these close collaboration models, they really harm the planet. Um, uh, if you look at all these points that I made uh, previously, we need uh, uh, um, the sharing in order to solve the problems of um, uh, the world. So um, I can always call out others, but I also want to share uh, like what we are trying. And um, I think we also need um, the feedback of the community and input of, of others, how we can do better. But I, 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 let me share a bit what we are doing at um, the Force Asia community in Singapore um, or at the company that I started in uh, Berlin um, to support the drive to uh, collaborative um, open source production. And I want to add here um, also a collaborative collaborative um, society. Um, so um, we have many projects that we develop and uh, um, not all the projects always under active development. Sometimes people come, sometimes people go, sometimes people get a job. We have a lot of people signing up. But what you can see here, we are always also interested in, in hardware. And for example, here, FOSS Asia Knitting, it was a very big thing um, a few years ago when it really helped uh, and, and collaborated with a few projects to bring them to the next uh, level, for example, upgrading old knitting machines. So um, there are alternatives everywhere where we can improve things and the textile industry is a big topic that we need to address. So. Um, a little bit of background, uh, I don't know if everyone knows about FOSS Asia. Um, we started this 2009 and basically we wanted to have an event and we were inspired um, by the work of OSI, by FOSSTEM and people around the world. And, we, and, and I was based at that time in Asia and um, with a few people we said, let's do an event. And at an event, people meet and they have ideas 
they have uh, projects and so we said like yeah let's host some ideas uh, on a um, git repository and um, then later we moved our git repositories to github when it became a big thing and over the time we had over 4000 people registering with uh, like with the organization but i you know, I mean, like big numbers are always impressive, but what is really important is what are the contributors who really uh, continue and, and engage with the project over a longer period or who make like important um, changes over a shorter period uh, of time. So we have around 150 developers um, active monthly. And as I said, they change. Um, I would say, and I estimate around 30 plus core developers in different projects. And we have um, 10, 10 people working for us in different capacities uh, full-time. Um, throughout the year, we're training around 2,000 developers in coding programs. So um, coding programs, for example, Coty pro program is one that's starting soon. And um, uh, we have a lot of uh, meetups. We are now, like, of course, have to transfer more to online meetings and a lot of um, articles also on our blog. So what projects? So um, a little bit going into detail with uh, yeah, the project um, that I have here, for example, Suzy AI. Um, and uh, um, like many people in the tech community, we are inspired by Star Trek and we like Star Trek. Um, so for example, here you see a picture of Scotty talking into a mouse when he came back from the future um, to the past. Um, then uh, he tried to talk to the computer. He said, what, this computer doesn't talk, that is strange. But today uh, it is a normal thing. We see a lot of um, voice assistants um, available, uh, but all these voice assistants are connected to a central cloud. And this is not how we can um, make like the um, assistant um, like sustainable and resilient because this assistant depends for example on a cloud in the us or depends on a cloud in china what if china uh, says yeah the communist uh, party like no no we we, we will now uh, block this or yeah or if, if um, the us say oh yeah that's part of a trade agreement uh, you can't access your cloud resources anymore uh, until you agree or something so this is really challenging and uh, potentially. So we need an, a voice assistant that is uh, independent. And there are a lot of cool projects. And we have here our own approach with a Suzy AI smart speaker that runs entirely on a Raspi, um, integrating with deep speech. Uh, but you can also potentially use cloud services, but you don't have to. And uh, of course, uh, many people um, are concerned here about privacy. So that's an added benefit. Um, if you just have things running locally, um, then you don't have to worry about uh, sharing um, your data uh, with like uh, companies that you don't agree with, or uh, like you don't have to worry about um, uh, hack hacks um, because um, it could be potentially even offline. So that's Suzy AI, that's what we're doing. And uh, we want to set an example here, work on a software mixed hardware project um, openly and collaborating at it. Our resources are limited, but you can also already see a lot of progress. And you can, for example, uh, join of our, one of our upcoming workshops um, with uh, Norbert, um, uh, how to install it uh, even on the desktop. So um, a lot of progress has been made recently. And our idea is here to make a wiki-like content management system. So quite a few interesting ideas um, how we can uh, also like make the creation of skills of these mini programs to speak, uh, how, how we can make it um, easy. So this is what we are doing with Suzy AI. And then like I want to talk more about like a project that's um, like uh, more in the direction of hardware, our pocket science lab, PS lab IO. This is entirely free and open. Of course, we don't control the chip yet. And uh, risk five is not um, uh, ready for, for our use cases, but uh, everything else is open. The entire schematics, this project is already developed since 2015 and we're producing it and, and work on this now here even in a EU funded program. Soon there will be a second version coming out that's really cool. You can connect it through desktop. You can have a Python app um, where you can like make your own configurations. Or if you just want to get started, use our entirely free and open um, PS Lab uh, Android app. 
And uh, you can do a lot of cool things with this if you're a scientist. So open science here comes into this. Uh, interestingly, nowadays, uh, science is not always open. A lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, like, schema like, like, for example, if you look at, at, at the data or so, it's not even always available. Um, if you think about medicine, if you think about pharmacy, if you think about a lot of different topics, uh, whereas like the definition of science should be that it is open. And that's it, what we are doing here up to the last layer of hardware. Um, for example, you can use this device as an oscilloscope, as a multimeter, logic analyzer, and many more, and you can plug in any sensor that is uh, um, compatible uh, with um, I squared C. So a lot of possibilities here. It's sometimes difficult for people to, to when, when I talk to them, what is this device? Because they say, what can this device do? This device is just like so versatile. It can do so many things. And of course, um, there's also a lot of work for us because if it can do many things, if it has so many uh, features and if it has so many possibilities to extend it, there's also a lot of work, a lot of bugs that can happen potentially. And um, yeah, even up to the firmware level, there will be an interesting talk on um, actually a, a panel discussion on firmware, by the way, tomorrow here at the event. And we're producing it in China in cooperation uh, uh, here with the Fraunhofer Institute in, in Germany. But uh, it is, uh, as I said, we can produce locally. So the next version that we uh, will sell in Europe, we will also produce that in Europe. Uh, whereas like uh, uh, versions that are sold in Asia, for example, can be produced in Asia. Um, of course, we have to see how this whole trade war thing is developing. But uh, um, yeah, we want to set an example here with producing locally, and that's what we do. Here was the first version, and soon will the second version follow, which we produce in different parts of the world. And then, of course, it's about reaching out. As I said, let's inspire others. So we do ma maker workshops here, for example, um, in the um, uh, Science Center in Singapore, or in the hacker space in Singapore, which you see here on the bottom right. Um, and uh, then we do, yeah, here participate in events like the Science Hack workshops um, or Science Hack Days in India here. This one was, for example, in Belgaum. And um, yeah. Then we do um, other things like, for example, like uh, uh, um, trying to inspire uh, new and young people who come um, as developers here um, into the community. For example, on the left hand side, it's just amazing how many people join events in India. And um, that was an outreach event for our Code Heat coding uh, program, which is, as I said, starting soon. And uh, then we do workshops, for example, with uh, development aid cooperation that like fund part of these activities here, um, as an example, for, uh, in, in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta. And uh, yeah, we do hackathons with the UNESCO. Um, so right now we're talking with them what we can do online. Um, here's some pictures of a hackathon in, in Saigon in Vietnam. That was 2018. And uh, then we do Jugaad Fest. I don't know if you know Jugaar. Uh, Jugaar is like this idea of hacking the Indian way, making things work. Some Indians regard it as something negative, but I think it's just so beautiful to, to make something work out of yeah, very little resources. So, so this is actually just so inspirational. And um, uh, we said, let's take this as a, as an, as, as a name even for, an, uh, for annual events. Here and we went to Hyderabad, and in the BVRT uh, college, we were able to uh, run this event, and we're cooperating with BVRT. They're great supporters. And then we have the annual FOSS Asia signature event, uh, which is the FOSS Asia Summit. It's taking place since um, yeah, 2010, 2009. We had a smaller pre-event, uh, and um, that is uh, happening every year in March. So we're sharing all of this. And uh, as I said, uh, yeah, I'm right now in Berlin. So of course in Berlin, there are also events. For example, you see Mitch Altman here. Um, you see a lot of people who, who you might have met at other events. And I think this is all already very overwhelming. Don't you think? I mean, you see all these events, you see all these people and you say, wow, wow, this is too much. But that's what I want to do here. I want to overwhelm you guys 
um, to to engage and and do uh, and continue this and 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 be inspired and just say yeah uh, so many things are going on I also need to do something but we are not perfect of course and uh, we're always happy to to learn more and one critic from the past was um, that we don't use a um, free and open source tool to organize our events so we checked uh, uh, out and, and tried to find a tool but at the time when we started that project eventier or open event software um, uh, then we didn't find any um, uh, project nowadays there are different projects pre tiles or the susie community as well and so on but at that time we, we couldn't find one so we started our own um, because there was no good ticketing and speaker handling system that was uh, open. And uh, yeah, we ran events up to 3,500 people. And it's really great to see that um, uh, here at the OSI, um, it's also using Eventier. Um, we discovered a number of bugs. We also discovered an, an issue with the integration of PayPal, um, which was actually also like a challenge here with the documentation at uh, PayPal, but um, uh, that was really an opportunity here to improve the system. And thank you very much for uh, patience. Um, I'm coming to the end, but I still want to mention a few uh, technology stacks here. So if you are a developer and are interested to join, for example, the open event uh, project uh, here, this is the current state of the project. How far are we at different components that we need? So um, let me uh, not close this uh, talk um, without uh, mentioning that we actually um, are very happy to, to, to see you joining um, the development, of course. So, so software, hardware, production, it all needs to be open source and we try to um, make this happen. So let's talk about how we can build a sustainable and resilient open source production ecosystem everywhere. Let's do this. This is the end of my uh, talk. So thank you very much for um, chiming in here. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So I see already here, uh, Justin mentioned in the chat, funding for open source startups and new models to VC funding. I have to give a plug for some of what I do with the UNICEF Innovation Fund, where we fund creation or collaboration open source products only. So this is the right direction. Um, it, it must be open source only. Um, and I'll definitely check that out, Justin. Thank you very much for, for, for sharing it. Um, I also like uh, I switch quickly over to the shared notes. Um, Ah, my English is fine, much better than your, my German. Well, thank you very much. But like, I think there's uh, still a lot to improve. Um, so please list the questions. Uh, uh, yeah, please list any questions or um, you can also like uh, just like uh, use the microphone. Yeah. Here is the question for um, a successful open source pharmacy community. Um, so do you know a successful uh, community here? I don't know a successful pharmacy community and I see a big challenge um, in that because if you want to uh, sell um, uh, medicine or like uh, pharmaceutical drugs, then you often need uh, to go through an extensive um, licensing process uh, with uh, um, authorities. So for example, um, we have one project where we have this uh, kind of headband for, um, uh, for neural waves, yeah? And uh, if you want to use uh, such a thing like uh, in, in the medical field, then it would uh, have a long process. However, I know there are um, there is this thing biopunks, so that is related. There was also this book uh, biopunks a few years ago, and uh, uh, um, you should, there's probably the the biggest challenge. Chris Lamb, Chris, thanks for for this. There's openhealthcare.org.uk. Chris, um, any anything you can share uh, about this community? Um, anything you would, yeah, opening medication technologies and production standard, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, like that would be that we definitely need that, right? And I, um, I what what I see is um, uh, there was this COVID, COVID nineteen. Um, list of uh, um, devices that people all around the world do. So um, I think we can um, definitely share more about this um, in the channels here of the event. New Health. Yeah, actually, like, yes, now that I come to think of it, um, a few weeks ago, um, one guy from GNU Health, GNU Health, 
um, GNU Health was in, in the weekly um, open hardware meeting that we organize every Saturday. So, a lot of issues around privacy regulation issue again. Yeah. Hey, Mario, I had a question as well. Sure, please go ahead. So you, you made a pretty nuanced point about codes of conduct, and I, I think I missed it. Could you maybe repeat what was your recommendation for code of conduct as it related to your talk? Yeah, so, so um, for example, like I, as a non-native speaker, I, I sometimes have this uh, challenge that I, for example, get uh, confused and I really have to improve there with uh, the different uh, pronouns. Yeah, because like uh, they and and like in English, you only have you in, in, in singular and then you in um, plural also and so on. So whereas like, for example, in German or other language is like a completely different word. So so um, and and language is developing so fast. So um, this is often like very focused on in, in the code of conduct. And I think like um, what I, in my view, especially in international communities, um, we often should be forgiving a little bit more um, that that people don't always have this like deep background in this. What is uh, um, um, important for me in code of conduct is actually what people do. Because like sometimes we have people talking, sometimes we have people using the right word or the wrong word or, or whatnot. But actually, um, if things come from the heart and if we actually do good, if people do good around the world, um, um, then this should be also like um, somehow um, this kind of topic should be more addressed in code of conduct. Because if, if for example, like uh, um, like if we have like events or something and 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 people say this my thing is open source but it is not open source they're not following all the open source um collaboration uh, um, guidelines or something like that yeah or for example like in our open next program some people said we have um uh, here an open source project it is under the um non-commercial creative commons license that's not open source. So um, in my view, um, if we could start uh, to talk, uh, uh, um, when we talk about open co uh, code of conduct, if we talk more about the, um, the real actions, the real actions that people do, yeah? What is really open source? What, what is this? This is very important for me. If people don't share, for example, they shouldn't be allowed to call their project open source. Or if, if people only use open source license, it is maybe okay um, uh, to call it open source, but is it acceptable um, to talk about, you know, like where do we draw the line? I, I, maybe we can discuss about this more. I also don't have a perfect answer, but I see that we actually need to enable people around the world to collaborate with each other in, all, in order to solve the problems. So if we have more and more big companies and they close the community off from collaborating, by only releasing software every now and then and not accepting external code contributions, this is not the, an acceptable open source collaboration model. Yeah, I don't know. Does, do we understand? Does it? Yeah, yeah? I, I follow I follow you're saying. I really like the initial note of uh, being more aware of multicultural backgrounds and language and pronouns is quite challenging. So that that's a big note. The, the other parts, I'd love to talk to you for an hour about that, but there's a ton of good questions in the shared notes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, um, yeah, yeah, here's some questions. So, but I yeah, don't know I how much more time we have. Source. Yeah, can open source software be used as commercial purpose? Like, can open source software be used as commercial purpose? Is it possible? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, that is uh, clearly stated in, in the open source licenses. You can sell open source software and uh, um, you can like, you know, you can you can sell the GPL. You can take the software and sell the software with the general public license. Um, and uh, in some countries, uh, if you uh, buy a product with a license, it could even be an advantage tax wise. I learned recently from a tax accountant, so uh, definitely um, you can sell open source software. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
So, and I see here more questions. I agree completely with your assessment of the importance of open standards, but how can we in the force community with the unwillingness of several big companies to follow open standards? This is a very important question. And um, um, definitely, I think like the work of the OSI in this area is, uh, is important and we need to um, like encourage the OSI to take a more active stance on this. I know that Simon Phipps um, is uh, working on uh, standards levels and, and uh, co compliance, and I don't have the perfect answer. The first thing is to actively talk about this and uh, yeah, encourage and ultimately enforce standards. So um, I think we also need to um, be more active again on the um, policy level here. I hope that answers the question. Do you know a successful open source pharmacy? Also, that one we had. Have you heard of any commercial organization that have an IP licensing business model which transition partly or fully to an open source based model? Um, well, if I understand the question correctly, um, uh, do we have like an um, kind of proprietary closed source? project or company or community and, and, and that move to an open source model. Yes, there are many. And of course, the, one of the most famous one is the Blender. So um, um, yeah, we had many events. We had the chance to welcome uh, Blender um, folks. And uh, um, this definitely uh, yeah, is a great example. But I wish, of course, we had more examples because Blender, um, like how it was open source is was that actually uh, there was a lot of money collected and the, the original investors, they were paid off. So, um, so Tone Rosendahl could then uh, make his project open source because he needed um, his uh, uh, VCs to, to, yeah, to allow this. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, but of course, uh, yeah, we are trying, I hope we, we can see more. I also was thinking like, why, don't we see like, for example, some countries or something like um, buy, for example, like big manufacturers um, of uh, ventilators or something and release the schematics, release the, the work as open source. Wouldn't it benefit the entire world? And wouldn't that be a, quite a, a small um, expense? Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely with you. But if anyone else has uh, more um, points, you please fill it into number three. And I'm moving to number four. Does your community organize hackathons? Um, yes, we organize hackathons, um, uh, for example, in cooperation with the um, uh, UNESCO. So please um, yeah, follow us on uh, one of our channels. Um, subscribe to, to, to the email, like you find the links on fossasia.org and uh, uh, or on Twitter also. Number five, do you see open source being applied on non-software fields, for example, manufacturing? Yes, so that's what we uh, do in the Open Next uh, program, um, opennext.eu. Um, so I'm sharing the link here in the, um, the shared notes. So um, um, that is a EU-funded project and um, a lot of companies from manufacturing um, furniture to bicycles to electronics uh, like us yeah, are participating in this uh, and uh, we want to have like uh, examples how this can be successful and also like, uh, of course, inspire others. Thank you very much.